this. I think. How do you think that looks? Think that looks okay? Or good? I need. Mean, I would turn it a little. See the top angle. He wants the ceiling to match the little top one. Like that, or bring it down. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. We'll see. All right. Hi, Kathy Van Wee. Nice to have you along. Barb Weaver. Looks like the tree of life. I was thinking that that's like the tree of life, all lit up. And hi, Stephen. Karen and family. I maybe I don't know. You might. You know, oh, my wife. Hi, Rhonda. How are you doing? I just left you a while ago. I don't mean leave you, leave you, but I, you know what I mean. You were doing good when I was last at home, I should say. Hi, Carol. Hope you and John are well. Thanks for being being part of this tonight. It's always fun to watch uh, as people jump on. You wonder, oh, there, yes, John and Carol, so good. Hey, Jonathan McKenzie's watching. It's great. Thanks, Jonathan. Making sure we're doing okay. The ear scenes, glad that you're, uh, glad that you're along tonight. Hit that share button if you think about it and let people know we're on. And Cindy Farley over there in Queensbury. Frank, hope you guys are well. How's that grandbaby doing? Yeah, hit that share button and uh, let people know you're watching and uh, maybe we'll draw in some folks who normally wouldn't pop on uh, to uh, Durky Town Facebook Live. Um, yeah, I hope everybody's, everybody's good and some will be, I'm sure, getting in here right at the last minute. Oh, hi, Jody Robinson listening to Hudson Falls. Hope things are doing well there on William Street, I think it is, in Hudson Falls. You and Tracy are well. Hey, Bruce Pratt and Chris. Glad you guys are uh, along as well. It's nice to see Miss Maples watching. It's always good to have the dog community. Um, I bet Cassie's watching too. We should get her a Facebook page. No. No? No. No? no? Okay. So. All right. No <laughs> Facebook page for Cassie. You're probably right. Hey, Sharon McKenzie down there in the villages in Florida. Yeah, oh, the villages are wonderful. I bet it's a nice 75 degrees in sunshine, unless you have a hurricane, of course. But I haven't heard of any hurricanes this yet. So good to have you, Sharon, along. Um, let's see. We're getting close to time? Yeah, 6.59. Oh, we got a minute to go here. So thanks again for, uh, for being with us tonight. Yes, Chris and Bruce are there. You guys are a team, inseparable all these years. Chris, thanks for holding them up. You're doing a great job. Yes, Barb Weaver, glad you're with us as well. Eighty degrees in sunshine. See, I nailed it. I was, I was pretty close. I was pretty close over there on the on the east coast of Florida. Hey, from the Highland Thistles, they're in Fort Edward. So great to have Dave and Kim along. Good to see you guys tonight. I like I like that little uh, Highland Thistles that you that you uh, put me onto there, David. It's good. All right. Oh, I'm sure other folks are gonna be joining us, and as they do. Uh, make sure you say hi to them as well and welcome them. But um, it's just probably about time for us to get started tonight. So thanks again uh, for hopping on. And, uh, and here we go with Spy Wednesday. So let me begin uh, with a prayer. And then I'm going to read my text from Isaiah chapter number 50. And then Joy is going to be reading a story that is taken from Matthew's Gospel. And what she will be reading will be interwoven with my message tonight. And we're going to pull these two texts together and um, talk about uh, Judas in relationship uh, to Jesus. So let me pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together tonight. 
even though we're apart. And um, it grieves us that we are apart. We've, over these years, enjoyed uh, the Fellowship of Holy Week, uh, whether down at St. James or out at Turkey Town. And Lord, there's a part of us that uh, we're sad that we can't be together in the same room. But we do give you thanks for the technology that we are afforded that allows us uh, to be together even in this even in this format. So bless your word as it goes forth. We know that it will not return empty. It will accomplish what you set it forth to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah chapter number 50. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother a certificate of divorce with which I send her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened, that it cannot redeem, or have I no power to deliver? Behold my rebuke. I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. This is the word of God, and it is for our good. Come, you blast of my father. 
Father, take the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me into your house. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Then shall they answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you a drink? When did we see that you were a stranger, and take you into our house? Or when did we see you naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to visit you? And the king shall say, Truly, because you have done it to one of these my brothers, even the smallest of them, it is as if you did it to me. Then shall he say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me into your house. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not come to help me. And they sh also shall answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not come to help you? And the king shall say, Because you did not do it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did not do it to me. And these shall go into everlasting punishment but the good shall go into eternal life. While Jesus spoke these words, there was one disciple who was not listening. Evil thoughts had come into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Judas did not love and trust Jesus, and when Satan whispered a wicked plan to him, he gladly listened. Satan suggested to Judas that he should sell and deliver Jesus over into the hands of the priests and Pharisees who were trying to kill him. Secretly, Judas went to the high priest and said, What will you give me if I bring you Jesus when he is alone? The council of priests promised to give him thirty pieces of silver. Of course, neither Judas nor Satan could have harmed Jesus if he had not allowed them to do it. Jesus was truly the Son of God, and he was far more powerful than Judas or Satan. It was not the jealousy of the priests, nor the greed of Judas, nor even the hate of Satan that brought the holy and sinless Jesus to his death. Jesus died because that was what he had come into the world to do. He died because he wanted to bear the punishment of our sins, the punishment which otherwise we would have had to pay ourselves. He died because he loved us. And if we love him and trust him, he will save us from sin and death. Thank you, Joy. One of the most important insights we receive concerning the death of Jesus is that his death is both substitutionary as well as representative. In, in other words, he dies in our place. As Peter wrote, he who knew no sin became sin for us. But Jesus also dies as our representative, that is, he is the second Adam. He is the one who has come and he obeys perfectly. And it is through his faithful obedience that salvation comes. As we think on those great truths, we should also see the other characters in the story of Holy Week who in a way act as representatives. The actions of the people or the leadership are of course what we too would have done if we had been in Jerusalem 
2,000 years ago. Now, I, I don't know about you, but um, when I read a story, or even when I make up a story in my mind, I tend to drift towards uh, taking on the hero character. Flawed, perhaps, but heroic, you know, nonetheless. We generally don't make ourselves the villain in our mind stories, or we generally aren't drawn towards the villain. Uh, because as humans, we, we tend to have this uh, thing called self-justification. We want to think best of ourselves, we want others to think best of us as well. In other words, you know, we may be flawed, but we are not as bad as we could be, and certainly, you know, not as bad as someone else. But if you take the various characters um, in the story of Holy Week, who act, uh, you know, in a way as representatives of the human race, you know, we can sympathize with some of them, like Peter. We can sympathize with Peter and his denial. We can sympathize with all of the disciples who left Jesus and, and ran away. But we're less likely to identify with Judas, who sold Jesus outright. We might be willing to say uh, that, you know, we're like the thief on the cross, you know, after all, he gets to go to paradise. But we wouldn't want to see ourselves as Pilate, who had all of the power to release Jesus, but was indifferent and more concerned about his own political future. So why? Why is it that we struggle to see ourselves really as God would see us? Well, I suppose... It is part of our humanity. Again, we drift towards self-justification. But I don't believe it's something we should just accept. I don't think it's a good thing for us just to assume that we're okay, you know, and everybody else has got real problems. And here's why. When Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he doesn't simply accept the self-delusion of the people. Instead, he confronts the people. He confronts the nation. Part of the story that Joy read uh, was the words of Jesus who talked about coming judgment. He talked about the need to be ready for when he does come in judgment. And so Jesus wasn't simply going to let the people remain as they were in a self-delusion. In fact, when he comes into the city, <coughs> excuse me, he curses the fig tree, he cleanses the temple, and, and he does these things along with his teaching to force people to finally act in honesty towards him. Excuse me. And of course, Judas, then, is one of those people. This is Spy Wednesday, as it is traditionally called. It is the night in which Judas, then, uh, goes to find a way to betray uh, Jesus. And, and we might want to ask the question, what would it have been like to be on the inside with Jesus for three years? You, you might think, oh, it would have been fantastic. It, it would have been wonderful, and I'm sure in so many ways it was. But if you think about it, Judas would have seen all the things that Jesus did in public, as well as how consistent Jesus was in private. And yet, it's interesting, isn't it, that along those three years, Judas is holding Jesus at a distance. And it isn't until the very end that he is forced then to be honest about himself and about his own intentions towards Jesus. I think you'd have to agree with me that it is no small thing to betray somebody. 
especially to betray somebody that you have been close to, somebody that you have walked with in friendship and in fellowship. And, and we should know that the betrayal of, Ju of Jesus by Judas is somewhat different from Pilate or Herod's actions. You know, they had only heard about Jesus. They, they had never listened, for instance, to Jesus praying. They had never been in the boat and seen Jesus calm the seas. They, they had never watched Jesus play with the children and embrace the children. Judas had seen Jesus give the dead back to those who were grieving. Judas had seen Jesus feed hungry people. Judas had seen Jesus minister to the least of these. Imagine for just a moment what it took for Judas to finally say, enough. And then to plant a kiss on the cheek of his friend and hand him over to the authorities. I would suggest that his actions are representative of the actions of humanity in general and of us specifically. You know, I'm doing a book study this week with a wonderful Christian brother in our church and one, one of the things we talked about this morning is how easy it is to make sin a rather abstract concept. Just kind of something we do. As if what we do doesn't really have any, any impact, that it doesn't have any effect. That discussion kind of led me to ask a question then. How do we get to a deeper understanding of our own condition? You see, I think Holy Week helps us answer that question as we listen to Jesus force a confrontation with his people, even with those who are closest to him. And as he does it, it then leads us into what we might call the deep end of the story. And what comes into view is that Jesus rarely confronts things on a surface way. You know, when you, when you, when you think about the work of Jesus, it's always on a much deeper level. So, so think about it. You know, with Judas, he gives the money back. <laughs> but the money was really just a surface issue. It, the real problem with Jesus or with Judas was something that was much deeper in his life. And what, what um, Jesus confronted then in Judas was a heart issue. And what Jesus, uh, Judas learned was that he was unable to recover from himself. The confrontation by Jesus, which was simply to be Jesus, perfect, pure, and righteous, holy in every way, eventually led Judas to a self-realization. And the thing that Judas realized was that he was not able to recover from himself. I'm in another book study with a couple of friends of mine who are uh, pastors, and we're reading a wonderful book called um, On the Road with Augustine. And one of the things that Augustine believed is that you can be a prodigal without moving an inch. I want to say that again. You can be a prodigal without moving an inch. You don't have to leave your father's home and go to a faraway country to be a prodigal, to be like Judas. Because the real issue is down in the depths of our hearts. In the place where, you know, we've, we've covered it with protective gear and a sign that hangs on the outside of the door of our heart. You know, no entry allowed. 
For, for many people who would want to be followers of Jesus, they allow Jesus into certain spaces and certain places, but they don't let Jesus into the entirety of their lives. And so it leads us then to a question for this Holy Week. How deep has your repentance reached? How far does your repentance go? The prophet Isaiah wrote about this when he tells us that God's servant would not turn back from the mission he was sent to accomplish. In fact, the language tells us um, about the complete willingness of Jesus to force the action of the people as he gave his back to those who strike, as he gave his cheeks to those who pull out the beard. It says, I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. There, there are two entirely different ways to respond or to confront people who are abusing you. There is the kind that most humans would do. We would resist, we would fight, turn our faces, deflect. But Jesus now is entering this place of his own humiliation and his need to sacrifice himself fully. And so a way that he confronts the evil of people is to receive their evil in all of its fullness. And this is a very important part of Holy Week. Because we should be clear that when Jesus enters the city, he doesn't come in as a victim. He is coming as the one who is going to fully conquer, but the road to victory will be humiliation. Even the humiliation of having one of your friends betray you. And it is out of this humiliation, then, that hope springs for people who don't just need salvation, but for people who are willing then to let repentance go deep into their life and they throw open the corridors of their entire life and they say to Jesus, come into all of me, not just parts of me, for all of me, Lord Jesus, need your salvation. As the story unfolds during Holy Week, what the people see and what we should see is not an increase of human power or of even evil. What we are seeing as Holy Week progresses is the power and might of God's servant who forces the action and then overcomes the enemy with love. Jesus is the one who sustains us in weariness as Isaiah writes in Isaiah 50, because he is the one who wins great victory for his people. So through Isaiah, Almighty God would ask this question, is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power that I cannot deliver? It is not easy for humans to ask for help. And it is not easy for humans to kind of grab a hold of hope. But never forget, the hound of heaven will pursue you just as sure as Jesus pursued people when he came into Jerusalem. He pursued them by cursing the fig tree. He pursued them by turning over the tables in the temple. He pursued them as he taught them in the temple and reminded them of the judgment that was coming on Jerusalem and ultimately that he would show himself to be king over all. And he pursued them even as he took their scorn and their violence. And when he stretched out his arms to die on the cross, he was pursuing people. He was confronting unbelief. But to come into that salvation then requires honesty about who we really are. And it will require a much deeper repentance than maybe you actually thought you needed to give. If you're willing 
to do that, if you're willing to turn from sin and self and to turn to God for help, He will help you. He will give you Jesus as Savior and friend. The sad truth is that after three years of life with Jesus, Judas had had enough. Have you? Have, have you had enough of Jesus? Because you're unwilling to let Jesus get to the deeper issues in your life? You, you see, the Jews, they also were done with Jesus. Are you? Are you done with Jesus? What will you do then with what you've heard? How are you going to respond then to the offer of deliverance that is made both in Isaiah 50 as well as in the gospel accounts that Joy read? When, when Jesus offers himself and shows us how we need to respond to him. Once again I ask, and I've asked this question throughout the services we've held and throughout the sermons that I've preached. How can we help you? How can we pray for you? What questions do you have about Jesus? Jesus, the one who is not just a consolation of Israel, but can be our consolation as well. If you're struggling, working through the web of the seed or You've been disillusioned in some way by Christianity or the message of Jesus or the church, whatever it might be, but your heart is, is struck tonight with this idea, are you done with Jesus? Or do you need to throw open your heart's door and, and receive him? If you need help doing that, please contact us. Please let us know. Someone, me, someone would love to sit down and talk with you. Especially, especially if you are already a Christian. Because there are many Christians who appear to be close to Jesus, but may be getting ready to be done with Jesus. May be ready to be taking some step or action that would cause them to walk further away from Jesus, not just in their heart, but now externally. And we want to help. We want to say that Jesus is the one who can provide for us forgiveness and help and comfort and the consolation that we need. As I close, I want to do so with a prayer and then um, with a reminder, would you pray with me? Oh Lord God, who, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his back to the smiters and hid not his face from the shame. Give us grace to take joyfully the sufferings of the present time, in full assurance of the glory that shall be revealed through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As I close, I want to leave us with this word of assurance that I picked up uh, from reading Dallas Willard some years ago. We are always safe in the kingdom of God. Go in God's peace.